All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to have you all here. And I also want to welcome Diana Larson. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, Diana. Um, Diana's uh, book, Agile Retrospectives from years ago is actually my first Agile book. Um, I expect it was Manny's first Agile book. Um, and I am really excited for the second edition coming out uh, this year. And um, I'm also really excited to hear about what Diana has been doing with the Agile Fluency Project and uh, what, what that is all about. So I am really looking forward to this. I don't think Diana needs a whole lot of introduction. I assume that most of us have heard of her um, and know a little bit about her. So uh, thank you, Diana. And I won't take up any more time and we'll let you get started. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to get see if I can't get my slides up. Um, so we're going to do a little bit deeper dive. I, you know, what one thing I didn't ask, uh, and maybe I'm going to stop this for a minute. How many of you have heard of the Agile Fluency model, know anything about it, have maybe read the original article? Yeah. How many of you? Nah, clueless. Not, not even. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that helps me know how long to linger in various places. So let's go, I'll go back and, and start sharing again. So um, I'm here with the Agile Fluency Project. I'm the uh, co-founder of the project and my role in the project is chief connector. Um, and, and so John, that's kind of linked to the conversation we were having in the breakout. Um, and, uh, and the Agile Fluency Project got started when James Shore and I wrote an article we, that we had worked on for several years and had shared around uh, through sending out uh, examples and emails and getting feedback, taking to our local Agile open conferences uh, and getting feedback and so on. And so that in 2012, we felt like maybe it was ready to be published. And so when we wrote that article, the article around the model we had created, we sent it out to a group of about 20 people. Some have names that you might find familiar and others, maybe not. A lot of them were uh, practitioners that we had met in organizations that we had a lot of respect for. And we had a few questions. Um, one of the questions was, does this describe your experience with teams or in what ways does this describe your experience with teams? And there were a couple of other questions, you know, is it, can, is it readable? Do, you know, do we need to edit it a lot? Things like that. And then the, the last question we asked was, um, and should we publish it? And, and if so, where should we, where, where do you think we should publish it? And so the response that we got back from Martin Fowler was that he would like to publish it on his website. And so we didn't turn that down. Um, those of you who are familiar with the very early days of the Agile movement know that uh, Martin Fowler was very central in that. And for years and years, he has been the chief scientist at ThoughtWorks and um, just is a contributor in so many ways, books and talks and, and in the thinking that he does for them. And so we were very excited. So we published the article and we kind of you know, brushed our hands together and said, well, that's that we're, you know, let's move on to other things. I was in the middle of writing the liftoff book with my colleague Ainsley Neese and, and James had some other things he was doing. And, um, and then after a few months passed, we started hearing about people who had picked it up and were using it in their organizations. And that was pretty cool. And um, we thought, oh, well, that's, that's nice. And, um, and then we heard from people who were like, well, I, it seems, it sounds so interesting. How do we operationalize this? And then I was working, I was consulting in an organization and 
uh, talking with uh, a vice president there of um, vice president of IT and uh, things like that and his organization. And he, he said, well, I, you know, I love this model, but how do I know where we're starting from? How do, how do I know where my teams are? I mean, I can make a guess, but I'm not close to them. How do I know? And, and of course, my response when it's what's going on with teams is always, well, have you asked the team, right? And so we started working with them, with him to create a way to ask the team, uh, which later on became our agile fluency diagnostic. And at one point uh, in about 2014, 2015, Jim and I looked at each other and we said, should we create an organization around this? It seems like people are offering us ideas and people are asking us questions and maybe we need a more formal way of doing that. So we created the Agile Fluency Project and uh, the, we created a vision for the model and the project and our vision was that we would work toward a world where Agile would be done well in every organization. And in order to do that, what we needed was to help create conditions so that every team in a business that said it was Agile would have the kind of fluency that met the needs of that business. And, um, and so that's what we wanted to work toward. And so that's, that's, how we, that's how we proceeded and formed our business around. And then there were people who were saying, other coaches and consultants, both internal and external, who said, well, I'd like to learn more about how to use what you're doing. And so we began incorporating them and now we're, how many years later, 2022, now we are uh, seven years later and, um, and still going. So the Agile, the, what we call the Agile Fluency Suite, what has happened is that original model has kind of grown into the model plus some other materials that kind of help us do that operationalizing that, you know, how do we apply this that so many people were asking us about? So we have the model and then we have the diagnostic so that people can help figure out how to, how to know where are my teams now um, and how, and are they making progress in their, in their goals, their fluency goals. And then out of that, uh, because the people were asking us, I, you know, we want to use these materials. How do we do that? we created something called the Agile Fluency Improvement Cycle. So it's a way of entering an organization and introducing these ideas where they are welcome and then uh, using them to move on forward with that. So the beginning of the Agile Fluency Improvement Cycle starts with the idea of where are opportunities? And what, what we look for is talking to leaders in organizations, usually senior managers or, lead, or executive leaders who have said, oh, we want to do, we want, we want to do more of this agile stuff, right? Or uh, I want, we want some of that agile, right? Or we've had that agile, it's not getting what we wanted, you know. Uh, how, how do we deal with that? And so in all of those questions that those leaders are asking is an expression of an, a missed opportunity. And so what we want to learn, first thing, is what are the, it's, we want to discover what are those opportunities that, that, the, that these leaders are looking for? What are, they, what are they hoping to discover as an opportunity? and help them to manage their expectations around that, <laughs> frankly. And so, um, so the first thing we do is we look at um, getting clear about their opportunity, getting very curious, asking a lot of questions, um, and, then, and then introducing them to the model 
so that they can say, oh, well, oh, this is the kind of fluency my teams need, or that's the kind of fluency my teams need. Because it is all about meeting the business needs, being fit for purpose, as we say, kind of in the complexity world. So those are the things that we're looking for when we go into those conversations. And so we want to talk about what benefits are they seeking? What, and what does that mean about their desired outcomes? And then later on, as you'll see, we'll get to another conversation about, and what are they willing to invest? So we start with a conversation uh, with those folks. And we use these kind of conversation starters. So when you consider a shift to Agile, what do you think would need to shift in your business or in your organization to make that happen? What, what isn't happening now that you believe needs to happen in order to really make that shift and get those benefits and those outcomes? And then, and then some questions around, well, so if you, if you made those things happen, if you created those differences in your organization, how would you know? How would you be able to tell that you've been successful at, at achieving those? And so we have conversation around that. And then finally, we ask, you know, well, if, if you achieved that, if you, if you got to see those results, if you saw that success happening, what impact would that have on your organization? Would it affect your top line, your bottom line? What other, what other things do you value that you think might grow based on if you could see those outcomes and those benefits? So we have that as a, as a pretty deep conversation. And by doing that, we learn more about what opportunities these particular folks that we're talking to see. And then, and then we introduce them to, well, so if you had teams that were fluent in Agile, um, and we talked about being fluent in all kinds of other things, but now we're talking about whole teams instead of individuals like we were talking about in our starter question. But now a, a, a team that has the fluency to get those benefits. What, what would that look like? And how would we, how would we move there? So that, so that we can then understand uh, what specifically is going to help this organization, these leaders achieve what they need to achieve. And, you know, the, the assumption here is that one size will seldom fits all. And I've got to tell you that as a, as a woman who has been a woman of size my entire life, I can guarantee you that one size almost never fits all <laughs> in any kind of context and certainly not around agile transitions. So, so what, you know, it's whether it's you're looking at a solution, a package, a platform, a method, if it comes as a whole piece that someone wants to settle on to you, it's probably not going to fit exactly. It's going to need some tailoring, some adjustment. And so we think about how can we tailor a, an approach to Agile that will uh, achieve the, what this business needs um, to, to get the outcomes and benefits at once. So Usually sometime around here is when we get the question, what is fluency? And, um, and we had some guesses early on um, and you were, you were pretty close. I mean, the, the people that I was talking to had a pretty good handle on it. But when we're talking about team fluency as opposed to individual fluency, it, it shifts a little bit. And it's skilled actions that teams can apply automatically without stretching or without thinking. And um, uh, who was, oh shoot, I forgot. The person that I was talking to used the word effortless. 
Um, and so, yes, routine, smooth, ease, uh, effortless, enables flow. It's the kind of thing we can do without thinking or it feels normal and natural to us. And when we're fluent, performance persists, even if distractions come in or things get stressful or we run into difficulties. Uh, I was talking about my fluency in driving a car and driving in snow, <laughs> which can be extraordinarily distracting and have things emerge in the system that I wasn't expecting. But is, am I, is my driving fluency adequate to meet those kind of situations? Can I just keep driving even when that's happening? And it comes, it, it, it's really a combination of understanding the what to do and the why we do it. So the skills and the theory and that, that, what we call praxis, the deliberate application of the combination of those things. And, um, and it comes from uh, an investment in learning. There's no way that we gain more skill without investing in time for learning. And part of the reason that I am so drawn to this work is that the commitment to learning and commitment to learning as a path to improvement and to doing things um, in, in better ways or, or, or smoother ways or uh, easier way, not, not easy in the fall off a log sense, but easy in the we can we can make this happen. It's not going to cause us a lot of stress or um, you know banging our heads against the wall. We can do this, right? That we learning is is key to that, and that's you know that's why I wrote the book on retrospectives with Esther. That's why I wrote the book about liftoff with Ainsley Niece about how do we help teams get started on their learning journey in that kind of way. It's always been a thread through all the things I've done. And so that's why this work around fluency is, is so important to me because the other thread throughout my, my career has been working with groups, working with teams, seeing the dynamics that happen in a group of people. And uh, you mentioned James Shore's book, uh, the, the sections that he asked me to write were about team dynamics and team improvement and, and those pieces, because he knows that that's, that's what I'm devoted to. So the fluency work is, is very important to me. So after all of that preamble, uh, this is the model that we came up with. And it looked a little different in the beginning. It was a more pastels. Now it's, it's a little um, more modern looking, I guess. But the, the idea being that there really are different kinds of fluency, just as there are different kinds of fluency in language, there are different kinds of fluency in all the things that we talked about, that you, all the groups talked about in their breakout sessions. Um, there, and you can stop anywhere along the way. So we came up with a, an analogy that we called the, the bus stop or the bus zone analogy. So we don't really think of these as levels of fluency. We think of them as zones. And you're, you're on a path to the zone you want to go to. Um, but in order to get to the zone where you want to go, you may have to go through other zones to get there. If you think about the, the transit system in your city or whatever. So what we discovered as we in our research and coming up and building the model was there were certain things that you needed to have in order to be able to even think you had any kind of fluency uh, in, in an agile approach. Oops, why did you do that? Um, and, but, and you could stop there. And that there were people who had teams who were working in that way and they were perfectly satisfied with them and they were perfectly satisfied with the outcomes they were getting and that that was a fine level, a fine zone 
of fluency for them to be in. But it wasn't true of every, or, of every team in every organization. And that there was another zone that incorporated all those focusing zone proficiencies and fluencies that we called the delivering zone. And it meant that we needed some additional skills. We needed some additional engineering skills uh, to build on what we had in focusing. We needed some skills at uh, more continuous integration at working with DevOps folks, at working with UX folks, some of those kinds of things. And for the vast majority of teams that we run into, Focusing or delivering zone fluency is what describes exactly what the organization needs, but not all of them. And for some folks that are really trying to stay out on the cutting edge, folks that uh, R&D teams, um, folks in, in some kinds of later stage startups that are still trying to gain some kind of a position in their market that optimizing zone was more what they needed because, and it had to do with even greater cross-functionality and some other kinds of things. We're gonna talk more about those later. And so that, and, and that incorporated the skills and, and practices from focusing and it incorporated the skills and practices from delivering and then added in some additional ones. And then, and so on, and then into the strengthening zone, which um, very, very small organizations can, uh, are often attracted to, where they're trying out not only new ways of building products and services and new ways of, of looking for um, uh, the, what, what's the right product or service to build, but the, the strengthening zone, they're, they're looking for new ways of governance, new ways of organizing themselves to do the work um, and those kinds of things. So, so what we noticed was that there was this layering. And just like if you're going to be a tourist, I, I'm, my, um, my daughter-in-law is from uh, Quebec. And so she speaks and she grew up speaking French. And so I've been trying to learn French so I can talk with her. I mean, she speaks English beautifully, but I thought it would be fun to be able to speak French with her as well and with my grandson, right? So I've been working on that. And her, um, you know, so what I want to do is increase my level of fluency in speaking French from where it was when I started, which was I you know, I could go someplace, a French speaking country and, you know, find my way, stumble my way around as a tourist, just fine. I could find the bus stop. I could find my way to the hotel. I could say, you know, do the, the polite things, the good morning, the good evenings, and the, can I get some food now kind of things. Right. Um, but I want to go beyond that in speaking with her. So while that suited me just fine, it was enough fluency for me before, it no longer feels like enough fluency for me. Now I want to be able to carry on more conversation to be able to tell stories about my how my day went, went and understand when she tells me stories about how her day went. And that's another zone of fluency beyond the tourist kind. So teams need to figure out what where is the, the zone of fluency that we need for our teams? And so we do that by asking those leaders in those early conversations what benefits they're looking for. We ask them, you know, how much transparency do you need? Are, what, where, what kind of risk reduction do you need? How much do you need to increase your productivity or your, and your return on your investment? How much do you need to increase, the, again, productivity, and, but also satisfaction, both employee satisfaction and customer satisfaction? What kind of benefits are you looking for? Because that sometimes helps them answer those questions about what's not happening now that you would like to see happening in your organization. 
And so we have what we call the core metrics of each of these zones. What kind of benefits do you seek? Are you looking for teams where you can, you can know always what they're looking at, working on and, and how that's, how that's, how they're making progress, you know, in, in way, in words that the business people can understand or in reports that the business people can understand and, and see how the progress is happening? Or do, are you more focused? Uh, are you, do you need all that? But then you also need to really have a focus on faster releases and, and lower risks and costs whenever the business wants to release and whenever the, you know, the pull of the customer says it's time. Well, in that case, maybe you need delivering zone fluency for those teams. And beyond that, do you need, does you need teams that can describe where their product stands in their market and how, they're, how they can Im improve that position? Then maybe you need optimizing teams. So you can see that not every team needs to be an optimizing team. And as a matter of fact, many teams don't. More teams maybe need to be delivering teams. And certainly there are a lot of teams that need to be focusing zone teams. And over time, we're beginning to understand, you know, what are the industries, what are the functions in an organization and so on that tend to maybe fall into each of these categories, which gives us some clues to have those conversations with leaders, but doesn't, but doesn't give us the whole answer. We still need to have those conversations. We can't come in with that kind of, I'm going to tell you where you need to be um, approach. No, this is a this is a, a journey of emergence, and we are working on it together to figure out where we want to go. So, um, so we've kind of expanded the model to look at not only you know what's going on in each of these zones, but what does that mean in terms of how long it might take if we're trying to operationalize or ap apply the ideas in the model. How long might it take to do that? How long might it take to uh, achieve focusing zone fluency? And, um, and that, you know, you might be starting from a scrum place. You might be starting from a Kanban place. You, again, one size does not fit all. So part of what we're trying to discover here is, you know, what are some of the kind of places that we'd want to start? And then what will we adjust from? What will we tailor the approach from that. And so uh, the, other, the other thing I've seen work very well for teams in the focusing zone is they'll just go back to the Agile Manifesto and they'll say, what, how can we build a process? How can we build teams that, that satisfy these conditions? So, which I just call ad hoc Agile. It's not, it's no, nobody's formal method. It's just a, a taking on the thinking that's represented in the manifesto and trying to build your, your agile approach from there. So, and then in, in the delivering zone, we're looking at um, things like um, a lot of learning around, um, you know, interacting with people, maybe having a cross-functional team with people who aren't just software developers. Maybe they're DevOps folks. Maybe they are um, UX folks, maybe they're training designers, maybe they are, uh, you know, they're beyond sort of the developer tester or the, the programmer tester group, right? We're, we're moving beyond that in our cross functionality. And generally that means understanding quite a bit about DevOps and about maybe some of the extreme programming engineering practices and those kinds of things. So if we need delivering zone fluency, we're gonna be now looking at what is there in Scrum or Kanban that, and then extreme programming and DevOps, how do we, how do we put this together and figure out what's the right set of things for this organization and the pro kind and the nature of their product and the nature of their organizational culture and so on. And then, then we we'll go on to the optimizing zone, which is now we've got even greater cross-functionality in team. Now we have the business people not 
as product owners or product managers kind of interacting, coming in from outside the team and talking to the team, but now actually embedded in the team, business expertise in the team, all full-time, along with marketing and sales or whomever else is needed to get the kind of understanding of the customer that, that we need for success in the optimizing zone. And the interesting thing is, is that from early times, this has been, optimizing has been the promise of Agile. We're going to have these glorious cross-functional, completely autonomous teams, and they're going to do all these things. And, you know, and then when that doesn't happen, we say it's a failure, but I think it's more that it just may not have been what was needed. And was it a failure or wasn't it? And is the optimizing zone more attractive to coaches and consultants than it is to the actual people building the work? I'm not sure about that. That's, that's some of the things that I think about. And then the strengthening zone, very few organizations need this. It tends to be fairly small organizations. Organizations that start out with strengthening zone teams often end up moving to back into optimizing zone, some combination of the previous zones uh, as they grow. Because strengthening zone requires a lot of ability to for transparency and ability to communicate all throughout the organization in order to make it work. And as an organization grows, the communication overhead of that just becomes too great. And that's not a failure. It's just they need a different, a different kind, a different way of approaching this now. Um, and so, so this is, you know, the model describes all of these things. So, and within each zone, um, one of the new things that we have added in um, in the art of agile development in the second edition that uh, James book, um, and. And I, he had me, he had me involved in parts of this. And so everything that's in there that speaks to the model is something that I completely uh, endorse and support. And one of the things that we came up with was this idea that actually th there's a big question that we always get about, well, is the agile fluency model a maturity model? And it's not, I mean, because we aren't saying one zone is better than another zone. We're not saying you're better if you're a four than if you're a two. We're saying, well, what does the situation require? But if there is something like maturity, we believe it happens within the zone. That as a team enters the zone, they begin as, at, with learning and they become more proficient, and then they become fluent, and then they become independently fluent. And then they may stop there, or they may feel like they want to go to a different zone by that time. That's, you know, that depends entirely on circumstances. But for a team to be independently fluent, the whole team independently fluent, in a zone means that they, they exhibit the proficiencies, the skills, the practices, everything that's needed to work in that zone. They do that without thinking, routinely, with ease, even in the face of distractions, and they don't even need a coach or any particular team member in order to make that happen. And the other piece of that is, and they are able to incorporate new team members and very quickly bring them up to speed at, at that same, in that same level of fluency. Part of this is building what we call team co-intelligence, because not everybody on the team needs to know every single skill. But this is where we come, we fall back on the idea of the generalizing specialists. We need enough bench strength on the team that if something happens, if the if COVID comes through or somebody uh, gets married and needs on short notice and needs to go on a honeymoon trip or you know anything that might disrupt the the flow of development, do we have the skills to respond to that? 
And can we do that without having a coach or somebody else reminding us to do it? Uh, if we can do it and have, and have a coach that reminds us, we're still fluent. We've still got all those skills. It's just that we need those occasional reminders when things get bumpy or things get tough, right? But team co-intelligence means we can cover, we have enough bench strength to cover everything we need, no matter if somebody is out sick or wins the lottery or whatever might happen. Or, or if the organization decides to change, change direction and our, and our product changes radically, we can roll with those punches, right? That's fluency. And if there's a coach present and as a reminder, that's, that's still fluency. But certainly in the learning progression and the learning part of the progression and the proficiency part of the progression where they're still stretching into it, they still have to stop and think about, oh, yeah, let's make sure we refactor. It, it hasn't become, TDD hasn't become automatically a part of just, this is just how we work. It's something we do that's special. We can do it but we only do it on special occasions. That's proficient. But fluency is we can do it all the time. And, you know, maybe some big visible charts and having a coach around to nudge us in the retrospective might be helping us, right? So this is new. This is not in the article. It's in, it's in James's book, along with some other things that are kind of new to the, we're always, looking at ways to improve the article or to improve the, our understanding of the Agile Fluency Model because it keeps teaching us back. That's a wonderful thing. If any of you ever find yourself in the position of being a, a model creator, uh, I promise you what you will find is you'll put models out into the world. People will start using them and then they'll start teaching you back about the things the model can do. Like when we first when we first published the article in 2012, we thought pairing was going to be the be all and end all in the delivering zone. But now ensemble programming has come along and mobbing has come along, and that, but we see that it fits perfectly right into that delivering zone. So even as new ideas are entering the agile movement, the the model incorporates them and can see how they fit. So, so I'm going to stop here for a few minutes and see uh, if anyone has questions before we go on. I appreciate the one size fits all endorsement in the chat. <laughs> Does anybody have a question or a comment or a reflection? I, I have a Okay, cool. I am muted. Uh, yeah. I have a question or comment. Um, can we yeah, go we'll... back a couple slides to where it showed? Yeah, uh, yeah. one more to the one right. One more? Yeah. Oh, sorry, to the right. Two more. Oh. Uh, where it shows the actual progression through the model. There? Yeah, I just wanted okay. to <laughs> reflect here about my um, mm -hmm. transition, especially learning Agile. Um, for me, it was really. I started off in the delivery standpoint, um, mm -hmm. and then it, kind of learning XP practices just from, right, you know, reading some books, and then found myself learning focusing. Yeah. I know this model's more for the team, but I'm curious: has any other individuals had that same experience where you yeah. start off focusing on delivering, and then realizing you need yeah. now this layer of, yeah, you never really can get to that independent, fluent state without mm -hmm. the focusing zone skills. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and what Jim says a lot is, and and I, I believe this too, I just don't end up in the situation of needing to say it as much as him, but um, is, you know, that when, you, when you're thinking about what zone do you want to be in, mm -hmm. once you've made that choice, if you're going to be in the delivering zone, you're going to start learning all of it all at once, mm -hmm. right? And in some instances, some kind of skills are come on, gonna come online for sooner with greater facility, greater, greater fluency than other skills and so on. It tends to be that the skin skills in the focusing zone are tend to show up earlier with, with full fluency, with greater ease, right? Mm -hmm. 
but but not always. And um, and we used to have lots of conversations with Arlo Belshi about this because he liked to start his teams off in the delivering zone. And we said, well, that's fine. But eventually you're never going to get to collective coding standards without understanding how to be a collaborative team. <laughs> I mean, there's just, you know, there are just things that you're going to need to really get to that full fluency and delivering that are going to be skills that we have identified in the focusing zone. The thing is, we have seen people that only or teams that only have the focusing zone skills that are perfectly adequate to the situation that they're in. Sometimes some kinds of infrastructure teams that are mostly not working on external products, but working for internal, they don't have quite the, the same delivery cadence that's needed. Um, other uh, teams that are working on very short term um, new products or services, like maybe um, one that comes to mind is a team that are a few teams that were working with the marketing department and their job was to create websites that would only last two or three months. So mm -hmm. tech debt wasn't really a big problem because it was going to be retired before tech debt could really trip them up and, you know, those kinds of things. So the focusing zone teams in those kinds of instances can work perfectly well. Right. And they don't need the rest of it, but a lot of teams need more. <laughs> so yes, so absolutely, Cody, that, that's true. You can, you can start out learning the delivering zone skills, but as individual and as a team focusing there, mm -hmm. but eventually you will need to incorporate those focusing zone skills or you'll trip yourselves up. Well, it's we'll funny that de before. learning delivering led to that as it's like, yeah. oh, we really need to focus actually on what we're trying to yeah. do, trying to maximize the value yeah. of what we're delivering. Right. Right. But cool. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for that. Who else? Um, I, I have a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that uh, fluency is the return on investment from learning or that, mm -hmm. that's one definition of it. Yeah. Um, are there... Are there things that we can do? Are there preconditions or things that make it more likely that we can build teams that are able to learn effectively in order to build fluency? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, like, well, for one thing, the um, in the delivering zone, one of the investments is uh, pa patience through a productivity dip. If, you're te if you've got te the team members who have never done TDD or never used some of the other engineering practices, never done continuous integration, those kinds of things. While they are trying to learn those things, they're going to slow down, right? And so what we, an enabling condition there is we need to have managers that understand that. We need to have leaders that understand that and can give the patients knowing, having the confidence that on the other end, they're going to get an accelerated, uh, you know, they're going to get acceleration, but learning curve. I mean, their learning curve is real. It is a slowdown. Um, in the focusing zone, we talk about training managers as kind of one of the fundamental baseline things that needs to happen. A lot of managers out there, you know, bless their hearts, uh, have been used to managing individuals and managing teams is different. And so they need attention to learn how to manage teams and make space for team learning to not regard retrospectives, for instance, as something that you can do as a special side thing, as opposed to being part of the work, right? That it is work. It's not something extra that you do that kind of learning or, or all the other kinds of things, um, that people do on teams that really help them learn. Um, that I, I've come to believe in uh, that software development work is learning work. It's not, not, it's not even knowledge work. 
I mean, there was this great revolution where we went from kind of assembly line and hands-on work to what Peter Drucker called knowledge work. I think we've made a further transition now into learning work. We're constantly needing to learn on the job. So we learning about the customer, learning about the system. If it's a legacy system, we've got to learn about the system we're working on, learn about our teammates and how we're interacting. I mean, there's just so much to learn and it's constant. And there's always new technologies emerging that we need to learn about, new languages, all of that. And so, yeah, we have to set the stage for effective learning. And people are going to need to go through that le- that fluency progression. They're going to need to learn before they can be proficient, before they can be fluent, before they can, um, because that's just how learning goes. Mm-hmm. Um, there is no open somebody's head and pour the learning in and close their head and then now they're ready to go, right? They need opportunities for practice. They need, um, you know, be able to uh, what we call sandboxes and and different things like that need to be set up for sure, for sure. And there's lots of learning to be done in here. Even in optimizing zone where we're probably looking at fairly senior team members and and so on, they're learning about the market. They're learning about the customers. They're learning about market share and business decisions and how to be, how to budget their own product. Uh, you know, there's always something to learn and it's always a part of, of what we're doing. So. Yeah. I've, I've sort of come to see a lot of the agile practices as just tightening learning cycles, right? Tightening those cycles of learning. And, um, and I've, I've noticed that one of the biggest factors uh, in people not wanting to learn or, or people being resistant yeah. to those ideas is, uh, is fear that, that it's going to be their, their fault, right? Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. If we can create an environment that doesn't have that, that it, it sort of makes right. all of it a lot easier. Right. 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 So it's funny that you bring that up <laughs> because, uh, one of the books that no, not a lot of people know about that I wrote that I, I wrote with my son, Willem Larson, um, is called five rules for accelerated learning. And it is about setting conditions for learning. And then along with that, um, I've got a new book coming out that I wrote with Trisha Broderick that is now going into the production, the book production cycle. The writing is done. We're now doing all that stuff that you need to do to publish the book. And, um, And we call it Lead Without Blame, Building Resilient Learning Teams. And it is about exactly that. How do we set those conditions? How as leaders, uh, whatever level we are a leader, whether we've got that title or not, if we're in that role of being a leader in our, with our teams, how do we make that? How do we ease that? How do we make that possible? How do we tighten those learning loops and all those things? Absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm really excited to, to read that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna keep going because I'm noticing the time. So so we were looking at the progression questions. Okay, so, so one of the questions is, how do we prepare leaders and teams to produce those benefits? What do we have to build on? Well, how do we do that? How do we move that forward? And so here's how we figured that out. In our Agile Fluency Improvement Cycle, we now move from discovering those opportunities to understanding the system, we do a diagnostic or we do some other kind of assessment. We don't always do the diagnostic, but we, we hold that, we take some time to understand what, how, where are the teams now? How, where, what are they satisfied with? What are they not satisfied with? Uh, how, are they, how are they producing the kinds of transparency achievement and, and alignment that, uh, that are needed And then when we have that, we can come up with some ideas and recommendations that we bring back to the leaders and we say, okay, now we need to create an investment plan. So we tell them our ideas and we hear their ideas. And then together we do some kind of activity or something, we spend some time and we create 
an investment plan and there's usually way too much on that plan. And then we say, what can we do in the next three months? And so we, we come together and we figure that out and then they, they start making those investments. And at that point, they're looking at what investments can they make? What are the trade-offs that they're going to need to make? Can they do, can they, are they trying to bite off more they could chew? They want optimizing teams when they can really only afford to the investments that are needed for delivering teams. And what does that mean about helping them manage their expectations? And, and so on. So, um, so th and this, this first set of these boxes are what we teach in our workshops. Um, and, uh, and what we've taught people about how to use our materials, because the next part of it is, is something more. So the diagnostic, this is just an example of what one part of the report looks like, uh, where the team's fluent, where are they approaching fluency, where are they not fluent? Um, what we do with this is we only make a report when we can talk to multiple teams because we guarantee confidentiality to each team that we work with. We never share their outcomes. We give them a report. We aggregate all of what we learned about them and we give them a report, but that's theirs. And then we use that to put together with all the other teams. And then what we take back to the leaders is an aggregated report so that they can make system level decisions as opposed to finger pointing decisions at a particular team. And so we do everything we can do to make sure that the finger pointing cannot happen. Because, you know, if you've got that information it's in your, the manager, it's really hard not to use it, right? <laughs> so we just don't even want to set that temptation up. <laughs> we go in saying the teams are good, that that's going to be confidential to the teams, but we're going to show you the part you need to know and how to, how to work at the system level. So, and then the question is, we ask them is, do you have the will to invest in cultivating the teams? And, um, and so then we have another conversation about that. Um, what, can, what can you afford to invest in? And, you know, some of this isn't just money. I mean, it's not just throwing money at it. It's, are you willing to put energy into this? Are you willing to spend, if, you, if there's a champion, are you willing to spend the social capital it's, it's gonna take with, your, with the, your peer leaders to get them on board in the way we might need them to be on board? Those kinds of things. So we look for, for those. And then um, just to zero in and the focusing zone, the kind of investments that we're looking at is the training, the managers, but also creating shared workspaces, whether those are physical or virtual, a team needs its own place. It needs its boundary. And you can have like in team topologies, they talk about having the API for a team, right? That, but they still need to know where their boundary is right? So that they can know how they sync up with others um, and, and so on and so forth. Don't split team members across different products, that sort of thing. And then in the deliverings, and, and so not, I'll go back to that, not splitting team members across products is not necessarily an investment that will take money but it is an investment that's gonna require thinking differently about how you put teams together. So we look at, and we think when, we took, when I use the word investment, I'm using it in a broadest possible sense of you know, what of value are we gonna to need to put into this? Are we gonna to need to put our attention into it? What is gonna be work on our part? All of those kinds of things. So, and then in the deliver. <laughs> Right. Then in the delivering zone, um, you know, providing time that for that productivity dip for the lower productivity while learning is happening, making sure that there's slack or that we assume TDD and refactoring are a part of the work. Uh, but we need slack in any case, because there's always going to be uh, unexpected things that come. We can never predict what they're going to be. But we know that something unexpected is going to happen and we need to plan for that. Um, and 
you know, making sure that the, all the technical disciplines that we need are part of the team, uh, providing training and so on, and, and coaches, practitioner coaches. And then in optimizing, um, sometimes we need, even the, when an organization wants, an op, wants optimizing teams, we may need to start with delivering fluency first. Uh, just to build the trust with the organization that the team is actually trustworthy, that they are going to do what they say they're going to do. They're going to put in their best effort. They're not ever going to be sandbagging. Um, they're always going to be doing the best they can with whatever they have at hand. And they may be reporting that that's not enough. They may be reporting the impediments and so on. Uh, incorporating business experts full-time in the team may require a different hiring strategy. You may need more people with that kind of business expertise that can work on a technical team. Um, we dedicate teams to deep knowledge in specific products or markets um, as opposed to a feature factory kind of thing. And um, giving teams responsibility for budgets and planning and so on. So that's the whole improvement cycle. This is the whole improvement cycle. And here's where your tight learning comes in, Kevin. The idea that we are constantly creating these feedback loops and constantly learning from our experience and constantly doing the kind of empiricism that we say we do in Agile, looking at what's actually happening and making our choices from there. We're going to probe, sense, and respond, right? Where we know this is mostly a complex activity. If we've got mostly focusing zone teams, maybe, maybe it's a complicated activity, but if we're in the delivering or optimizing zone, it's complex. There's just no getting around that. And so um, we look at this, this part here, this devise experiments and conduct experiments and that loop, that's what we call the coaching loop. That's where the coaches are on the ground working with the teams to, to help facilitate these investments to happen and help the teams make the kind of improvements that they just wanna make internally for themselves. And then, we, and then uh, after a while, after a period of time, usually six months on the short end, nine months or a year on the longer end, we can, we can reevaluate the investment plan, we can reevaluate how where the teams stand now and if we want to change how we how we're approaching this. Um, but we try to do that. We the the trick is to after you use the model to assess the team, whether you're using a diagnostic or some kind of observational model or just some coach's deep knowledge of the team, whatever that might be, once once you've done that and then you've created an investment plan, you need time to actually enable those investments to make, you know, get those going. And then for the teams to, to benefit from those investments before they're going to be able to really show any progress in terms of maybe getting greater fluency. So that's what we want to pay attention to. And um, so that's why we build in all these feedback loops and, and we, we give time for the learning to happen. So if you, um, if anyone here would like a copy of this, um, this one graphic that has kind of everything captured on one, on one thing, if you get in touch with us at our contact us page, we have a PDF that we send out to people, anybody who asks for it. So if you just say I was at the Buffalo Agile Group meetup, um, our, our uh, operation folks will, will send that to you. So, um, which is kind of a, you know, I can't, I don't have a physical takeaway for you. So here's, the, here's this one. And if you want to learn more about the Agile Fluency Project, you know, go check out our website, agilefluency.org. Uh, we have a free downloadable ebook that has the uh, updated version of that original article uh, that we updated it a few years ago in 2018. And, and you can get that one there. Uh, or you can go directly and get James Shore's book. He's got a lot of it on his website. If you're, if you're, um, if if you need to 
if you're cash constrained and you want to get it for the least amount um, of money, you can you can look on his website. A lot of it's there. And he's been doing a book club where he's got some recordings and things there too. And then um, to continue with our theme of learning and how do we help these teams become more fluent, uh, I've written a book with Tricia Broderick called Lead Without Blame, Resilient, Building Resilient Learning Teams. It is, not, it is available for pre-order now. It's not actually expected to be out until September, unfortunately, supply chain in the publishing industry. Um, but it's available in a whole lot of places. Um, I just today checked and it's on Amazon, it's on Barnes and Noble, it's on Target, it's on Walmart, it's on all, all kinds of websites. And, um, and we are hard at work, Esther, myself and David Horowitz are hard at work on the second edition of the Agile Retrospectives book. And that's gonna be out even later in the year as um, we don't have a more of a closer date on that one than that. So any additional questions, uh, comments, reflections, how did I do kind of thing? <laughs> and I'm just wonderful. gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing there unless you, unless we need to go back for a slide or something. Yeah. So deeper dive into the Agile Fluency model and what's going on at the Agile Fluency project. Um, you know, we, we have no investment in whether people use this model or not. We don't get kickbacks or anything like that. Um, you know, we just, we just love to spread the word about it and we hope more people learn about it because we think that the idea that there is a one size fits all, we think the idea that um, you can just buy some off the shelf package and never have to be involved with it again at the senior leadership level um, is doing a lot of damage. I mean, it's, it's creating what people are calling dark scrum and fragile agile and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it doesn't have to be that way. We just need to take a more nuanced view. And I hope that the Agile Fluency model and some of the other things that are out there, like, like Modern Agile in, the, in uh, Industrial Logic and, and um, the FAST model that, that Ron Cortell is working with and, and that James Shore likes a lot, actually. Um, those, those things are beginning to approach um, our our look at how do we help organizations transition to getting better benefits and better outcomes. It's not about getting agile. It's about agile as a means to getting better benefits and better outcomes for the organizations and for the teams to make better workplaces. Um, so, I mean, people feel good at work when they have psychological safety, and when they feel like they're accomplishing something, something meaningful in the world. That's what Project Aristotle taught us. So that's what we want to see happen. And I think, you know, getting good business benefits along the way is only helpful to that. So thank you all for coming. And um, I'll hang around for a few more minutes if we want to have other conversation. Oh, that's awesome. Diane, I think this stuff is fantastic. I'm, I'm drawn to these models that are non-prescriptive, like you say, yeah. like this is something that should actually maybe not fit everybody perfectly, but more closely, right? It's something yeah. you can learn from. Yeah. Um, a lot of the work that I do and probably other folks here um, are working on these transformations of big companies that have all kinds of things in their way to be mm -hmm. able to follow a model that looks as clean as this does, right? <laughs> and so I couldn't help but think while you were talking yeah. at each of those stages, I could flip it upside down and mm -hmm. say, if you see fear culture, if you see a hero model on teams, if you see people not delivering code, but every three or four months or later, then you should be working towards getting towards this yeah. zone in the fluency model. Like the yeah. sort of like a, 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 a yeah <laughs> choose your own adventure sort of a model to say yeah. these are the the bad behaviors to lead to the the good yeah 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 i mean that you those you're right those things that you just ticked off on your fingers are inhibitors there's no question about that and 
what I look for in, I mean, and I maybe am a little privileged for the, with this, but I look for organizations where leaders are not so tied to the way things have always been that they're going to throw up those articles, those things and that if they get feedback that it's a fearful workplace, they're going to know it's going to take a couple of years maybe to yep. cure that, but they're going to start working on it right away and they're going to figure out how to do that. Those are the kind of people that I look for to work with. And there are a lot of them out there. Um, I tend not to work with really huge organizations because I think it's so much, it's harder. They want to, they want to broad brush everything. And I, I want to say, no, let's slice it. <laughs> let's, let's just start with this group here and get them functioning well, and then look at how they interface with the other things and see what needs to be fixed. You know, we'll do the refactoring around the edges of that so that it, yep. so the rest of the organ, and then, then maybe we'll expand to another place in the organization. It's actually faster. They think it's slower, but it's right. actually faster to get to full functionality, just like with code. Right. Let it grow it's organic. kind of a version of Conway's law, right? Mm. Yeah. That's let's get a slice and uh, go at it that way. So I'm a big fan of the maybe not down to the single pilot team, but to maybe a, a group of pilot teams and sure. then making sure that the second round gets as much attention as the first round got and those kinds of things. Right. Um, yeah. And, and starting with the managers. I mean, there is a reason we put manager training in, in the focusing zone, because yeah. that is fundamental. If you if, and, and that's where I tend to start, frankly, with my, um, it's what I learned back in the eighties and nineties, uh, when I was doing a different kind of, it's called socio-technical systems work. Uh, but in general, again, those folks were choosing to go with team-based work. And when once that decision was made, we the only way we're going to accomplish what we need to accomplish is to do it in teams of knowledge workers, learning workers. Then the next step is, okay, we've got to work with the managers to help them understand that their work is going to change too and help them be successful at working in this new way because they will then create the ground where the teams can be successful. And if they're in the way that we're just not going to get there and um, it, it's going to be painful. So even more painful. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that, that was just my, that's been my experience through my whole career. So I, that's what I look for. Yeah, I, I love this idea of driving towards teams that are fit for purpose, right? Not, not every team needs to apply every single tool in our tool belts. Um, if we've got a, a team that is doing infrastructure maintenance, well, we probably don't need to apply design thinking practices, right? Uh, it's, just, it's just true. Yeah. Um, so I, I love that. Yeah. I think that's a, a really good. Yeah, and I think some of it is we have to admit that as coaches, the optimizing and the strengthening and the bright and shiny alternative governance structures and things like embracing design thinking, ooh, those are just make our, you know, give us goosebumps. But not every team needs that. And coming to terms with the fact that we should not be expecting teams to do stuff they don't need to do just because we think it's cool. Mm -hmm. Um, is really important. And it's just like you don't try to, you know, teach a dot toddler to sail a sailboat right from the beginning, you know. Um, you, you know, th there's, yeah, anyway, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Jen, I'm wondering if you can maybe talk a little bit about some of the practices that I've seen teams get into early on and they can't seem to get out of them. Like everything in their backlog has to be written in the, as a, I want, so that, and everything yeah. has to have story points on it and everything yeah. like, how do you, how do you start to bring some of the transparency to yeah. the um, anti-patterns of that rote uh, behavior? Yeah. Well, I tell stories. Um, I tell the story of where that came from. 
um, and how, you know, for a long time, there were lots of ways to write stories. And I'll tell them, you know, we'll, I'll go back to the red book and the, you know, in the, in the XP canon, there's all those little books, right? And there's some really good stuff in those. I particularly love Ken Owls because he talks a lot about learning in there. Um, he, he, he inspired me around stand-up meetings because he recommended stand-up meetings that were, what did I learn yesterday that could benefit the team? What do I hope to learn today? What's in the way of my learning as opposed to, <laughs> You know. Anyway, um, but you know, there's there are stories there. Or I'll introduce them to Ron Jeffrey's blog, or I'll you know I, I see I'm not technical, so there are things I can't speak to from firsthand. But I know the stories, and I will share those stories, and I will say, hey, you know, this could be fun. Let's try it another way for a couple of sprints or for a, a few weeks depending on whether we're Kanban or what we're doing. And, um, and let's see how we like it. And if we, if we don't like it, we'll come back to this way. You know, I, the thing that makes me crazy, I one time had a, um, a, a client that asked me to come in and observe their boundary meetings. So their product demo, their, or sprint review, their retrospective and their planning meeting. They had for how much, it was like for a three week sprint, they had a seven hour planning meeting. And a lot of it was down to the fact that the, half of the people were in one place and half the people were others. So it was hybrid, right? And they were using JIRA. And they were using the, the, um, con the um, oh, uh, what's the name of the place? But anyway, that, that uh, form of writing stories that Mike Cohen. Uh, Connectra. Co Connectra, yeah, the Connectra um, way of doing it. And every single item on that JIRA list started out as, as a developer, I want. And that's all you could read. And there were 180 items. Okay. And I was just, <laughs> I, I was supposed to sit there and observe, but at that point I came unglued <laughs> because they had to open every single one of those. And I said, what? You know, well, that you're supposed to write them this way. And then we have to put them in JIRA. And then we had to, you know, and, and so all you could see was the points and the as a developer. And so we really had to go back to first principles and say, okay, all right, you've got to use Jira, you think. So, okay, fine. We'll take that as a base assumption. But in those items, you've got to give the meat of it. You've got to know what that stands for without opening it. And, and here's how we're, you know, let's figure out how we're going to write them in that way and how we're all going to change how we do things. And we have, then what has to be, when I open it, I have to know who does this serve, right? It can't serve the developer. <laughs> That's just part of the work, right? And, and so we went, we went through that and um, got that kind of cleaned up, which was good. And then they, they, at that point, couldn't stand me any longer, so I left. But uh, yeah, no, actually, we we left. We split on. It was just that was as much change as that organization could take at that time, because it was it was just such a mind blower for them. And that's you know I'm fine with that. I I'm a consultant because I don't expect to stay, <laughs> so I expect to be moving on sometime pretty soon. So. Um, but yeah, I mean, those I, what I, that's what I do is I, I tell them stories of how these how these came to be, how these practices came to be. How did we decide that it was a good thing to do this? What you know, here's here's Ron Jeffrey's story about that. Here's Bill Wake's story about that. Here's Ken Schwaber's story about that. I mean, you know, I'm not I, I, can, I came to Agile through the XP door, even though. I'm not a technical person. There was a time actually when I was on the track to 
being a software engineer, but that's a gender diversity story. That's not a agile fluency story. So I'm going to refrain from that one right now. But, um, but I, you know, that was so long ago that I don't have those chops anymore and I'm not active in programming. So, so I look for, for folks that I can tell their story or, or introduce their stories to folks. People ask me all the time, how do I convince so-and-so to do such and such? And my response is always, I'm not in the convincing business, but I am in the sharing information business if people are interested in, in learning more. And uh, so I'll always do that. So, yeah. So I think we're getting past time. So thank you all. Thank you, Diana. I really appreciate you. you being here and uh, taking the time out with us. It was it was awesome, and I yeah. can't wait for um, your upcoming books. I'm really excited. <laughs> yeah. All right. Bye. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank there you. you.